Right, so uh, welcome again everyone for Wireless Builder 6 at Airtight. My name is Heman Chaskar. I am the VP for Tech and Innovations here. Uh, Rick showed you a great demo of our whips. What I am going to do now is put some flavors and colors around it because I am sure everybody is asking what is unique, what is different about what Rick just showed, right? And we chose security as the topic today because just over past two months we saw three security breaches at three different retailers in US and the time window after the breaches is the best time when people are actually listening to the security talk, right? So today is a great day to talk security. Now, uh, Airtight uh, in initial years only provided overlay whips, meaning whips which uh, protects other Wi-Fi infrastructure. And it was so good that we actually made a profitable business just out of selling overlay whips, right? So I'll show you why. So uh, now that we also sell access points, all our customers get these whips automatically included in those access points without any extra licensing cost. Uh, we have pretty large uh, customer base for whip solution, including large fortune enterprises, government and DOD, and very extensive patent portfolio to protect this IP around all the techniques, tricks, and concepts that make these whips very unique and differentiated. Uh, for the beginners, very quick introduction to WIPS. What WIPS does is it addresses certain threat vectors, but they are different from what your WPA2 does, right? WPA2 is concerned about uh, protecting your man managed devices, your managed access points, your managed uh, clients, do authentication encryption, but there is a whole lot of other devices in your wireless environment which are not within WPA2's realm, right? Uh, you have rogue access points installed by <coughs> uh, mostly casual employees or they could be running as hotspots on your mobile devices and other laptops. Uh, you have your clients potentially connecting to external access points, thus violating your firewall policy or get fished into Wi-Fi pineapples. So all these kind of threats should be solved by WIPs. And what WIPs does is not only scans the channels, sorry, not only scans the channels, uh, where your authorized access points operate, but scans all channels because these threats can come on any of those channels, right? So, what has been the traditional approach to solve this, right? That's what we first need to understand so that we will know what is different about airtight. And the traditional approach always has been the user configures a lot of rules and the system then applies those rules to classify all the devices it sees around into broadly three categories. Mine, meaning managed, neighborhood access points, not a threat to me, or clients, and rogues, right, which I want to take, uh, you know, out of my network. And then there are a lot of signatures you will see in these whips, you know, air snarf, hot spotter, monkey jack, donkey jack, blah, 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 net stumbler, whatever you want, right? So there's a bunch of signatures that they will have and they will raise alerts on that. Then there will be a lot of packet statistics based anomaly detection comparators. So they will have broadcast packets, multicast packets, 2DS packets, from DS packets, blah, 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 right? And then obviously then it will generate a lot of alerts. Good. Is more alerts, more security? Wait and see. If more APs are not more capacity, more alerts is not more security. So then you have a lot of manual intervention coming in, right, to parse those alerts. So this is how all system operated. And with the exception of once, obviously. And that, before I go to that exception of airtight, I will show you some real examples from other systems without naming them, because we don't want VVV here, as we know. Uh, but uh, take home my point. <coughs> kind of, uh, this system, okay, this is a user guide of a, one of the web systems out there. What it is telling you is to configure these user-defined rules for classification on these many parameters of devices so many parameters, many of them have nothing to do, like channel or vendor, whether the device is neighbor or rogue, right? And then it is warning you that if you don't define sufficient rules, your devices will be misclassified. So you can see how quickly this gets cumbersome because of the permutation and combinations of these parameters that you will see in the devices around you, and especially for networks with large neighborhoods, okay? In dense uh, commercial districts, networks with a lot of branch offices, you will have tens of thousand devices around you. So that is the problem, right? Couple more screenshots from other systems, a lot of alerts when you have a lot of rules. And then this is a bummer. This is the best I find. So in this system, when you say 
enable containment, auto containment of rogue on wire. Ooh, there's a warning. Scary. The warning says if you do this, face legal consequences. Mm -hmm. Why? Because this system is not sure that even if it is a rogue on wire, is it really rogue on wire? Right? What if I hack my neighborhood devices? And then this is what we call as right bait and switch where you sell protection and then you say don't enable protection. Is it just uh, anonymous vendors up there, I guess? Yeah. No vendor vendor violence here, right? No hash VVV. <laughs> so, but you get the point. And then uh, that's the problem with user defined rules, right? Signatures, same thing. I will not elaborate, but the point is it is so easy to change signatures in packets. Will you ever rely on SSID based signatures to detect a sleep or air jack? I will not because I could have just put air jack here and then Lee would be running around his network trying to find that find that air jack, right? Though I'm just making fun of him by sitting in the next office. Uh, so same problem with uh, signatures and then <clears throat> the next point is kind of anomaly detection. Now here again, I call it eye candy because the point here is that there are a lot of comparators in the systems, but who knows the right thresholds? Who knows the right thresholds which will actually detect real attacks, but not raise false alarms, right? When you have a lot of false alarms, you get desensitized to them. What's the point of installing a system whose alerts have become meaningless to you, right? So that, that's the problem with the traditional approach. And kind of, if I have to, sorry, I'm going fast because I'm telling our entire profitable business in 15 minutes, right? <laughs> so I'm really sorry for that. <laughs> so here is the point, right? The, the summary of what all I said. And let me introduce you to you this device, WIPS Compass, right? This WIPS, com WIPS Compass will tell you the quality of security engine that is within your WIPS. Apply this to all the traditional approaches I told you, you will get very, very high overhead of operation and then as a side effect, low security, right? You are going to ignore alerts, you don't know how to configure rules, you don't know what the thresholds are. We wanted to change this status quo from very beginning, right? And then that's why we wanted to move this needle in the opposite direction. This is what you need. The high security, low overhead system, if you want to scale it to large enterprises, right? If you want to scale it to enterprises with many, many branches, enterprises with very low IT staff, this is what plug and play WIPS has to be. So that you take this point home, this is so important point, literally home today, right? We have crafted this handmade kind of BIPS compasses from the widgets that you get in camping kits. So please collect your own, you know, when you go home, so that you actually take this point home from here. So, okay, so what did we do differently, right? Instead of this user-defined rules, we decided to use intrinsic behaviors of the devices to classify them into three categories that Rick showed, okay, which are authorize my own, rogues, which are unmanaged but connected to my network, and external, which is unmanaged and outside my network. Then instead of chasing signatures and thresholds, what we did is focus on the risky connections. Don't focus on tools, don't focus on packet statistics. Focus on what is the connection that is exploited by the specific tool, okay? So I'll show you that. But how do you do that? without using signatures and thresholds? Uh, the risky connection part or first or second? No, the second one. Yeah, just give me a second. I'll show you a picture. Yeah, good oh, question. I just was channeling Scott. I want to lead you there. Good so. question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, again, high level of automation is very important, right? Because I told you distributed sites, branches, large enterprises, not enough IT staff. Alerts have to be concise. Prevention has to be reliable. Never knock off your neighbor, but always uh, capture the right threat, right? So those are the kind of things we focused on all this time. So before going into the question that uh, uh, Keith asked, uh, let's understand what our device classification looks like. So among all the devices that you see around you, there is a first branch, this is the managed APs. This is, I call it static part because this doesn't change too much. You can either manually import it or you can have WLC integration with Cisco or other vendors if you're overlaying it, or if it is airtight AP, it auto identifies authorized APs, right? So this is kind of easy part. And then among all the other APs, how do you identify all these other APs? Because any identity of the AP that is not in your authorized list is in this part, right? 
Now in that part, there are two branches, something that is connected to my network and something that is not connected to my network. So if it is not connected, we call it external, here blue, if it is connected, we call it row. Now if you follow this flow chart, you will understand that the crux of this classification lies in accurately determining connected or not connected. Okay, the, the distinction between manage and unmanage is easy. The MAC address that is not yours is unmanage. But among them, which one is connected and not connected? That's where the crux lies. So rather than focusing on the rules, right, focus on how you can accurately detect that part. And that's where all the other systems have failed. Those which use CAM table lookups fail there. Those which use MAC adjacency for wired wireless uh, MAC adjacency to detect connectivity fail. And I will give you a bunch of, you know, 15, 17 rogue <coughs> scenarios. Now, the way to, that's where the marker packets come in, to accurately detect what is connected to your network and what is not. And Rick kind of briefly mentioned them, but I will just reiterate what they do. So we inject these uh, small signature packets, both from the wired side as well as the wireless side, okay? And then we try to determine, or we do determine, uh, which APs connect those packets between the two mediums, right? So, for example, this airtight device has injected signature packets. They will obviously come out of this guy and the green guy because they are connected. Of which you know the green guy is your own guy. So, okay, no big deal there. But why is it bleeding out of this other guy? So, that's connected to your network. It will not bleed out of this guy because it's not going to get that packet in the first place. It's on a different network, right? Here, it's injected reverse direction and sent to a specific known device that we want. Uh, why do we do both sides? Because we want to cover bridges, we want to cover NATs, all kinds of access points. We want to cover soft APs running on laptops. We want to cover rogues which do not have MAC and uh, MAC adjacency between wired and wireless, right? You are going to rely on this. This better be perfect. So, so how, how would that catch a MiFi device? <coughs> would only be on the on the. If the MiFi device is just in the air, but not connected to my network, it will go as external and I'll, it, it will be stopped as a honeypot tool. So one more slide before I come to that. I'm sorry. So what is the advantage of this connectivity detection? It is that no reliance on switch infra, prompt detection, as I said, no false negative, very important. If you are using MAC adjacency, you will have AP showing up as rogues, uh, sorry, external, because they do not have MAC adjacency. But here it doesn't happen because even if there is no MAC adjacency, packets bleed out. No false positives, no legal disclaimers. When we call it a rogue, we have seen it bridging a packet to our network. It's not based on the rules that you have defined. Okay? So there is no need for legal disclaimers. Coming to Keith's point finally, how <coughs> you know do you de determine the risky connections? If you are able to do this coloring in an accurate automated way, and there is a same thing, the kind of thing for clients, which we can talk later because we are getting to end of the session. Your security policy automatically comes out of this. If you are a rogue device, which means unmanaged device on a network, <coughs> you will not allow any client to connect to it. Doesn't matter what client, my client, other client, hacker's client, because this is direct entry into your network. So you will block all those three red paths going into the <coughs> rogue AP. But if it is a neighborhood AP, my Wi-Fi, or something that is not connected to my network, I don't care what if other guys connect to it, like neighborhood guys and other hackers, but my guys cannot go and connect to it. This, this path blocks your all honeypot tools, like hotspot or air snuff, karma, you know, mega karma, whatever. So this is really the security policy you can enforce uh, when you have the right automatic uh, classification. Finally, there's one more step still, Somebody asks about, do you send DOTs? Yes. But do DOTs stop all the connections? No. Okay. So don't stop all the connections. They, uh, whether DOT works or not depends on the make of your device, drivers, whether it is in infrastructure mode or ad hoc mode, whether it can hop APs, right, of the same SSID. So only DOT is not about prevention. Okay. So what we do actually have included a bundle of tricks. And this is a long list. Uh, we don't have time today, but I will be happy to discuss with you later. A bundle of tricks so that it works on all types of red connections, right? That way you get automated reliable prevention. Uh, 
Rick showed you location tracking. We have very accurate location tracking. Devin mentioned stochastic. Again, uh, I don't want to go into the math of that, but the, the differentiator is that this is not about drawing circles around the APs and finding the intersection because that problem has the that approach is the biggest problem because you don't know the transmit power of the device. How are you going to draw the circles? And then you guess, right? So drawing circles is a bad approach. This is actually a probabilistic kind of technique which estimates at each point on this floor map the probability of finding that device and then shows you the points of maximum probability. But, and in doing that, it removes that bias because of the transmit power of the device. That is why you know, you'll find it very accurate without site survey uh, required. So this is not pattern matching. Does that technique. also imply then that the AP placement isn't important? Yes, it is. You need, at least need triangulation. Right. So Once need you do the triangulation, they are going to calibrate themselves. So they are going to find stochastic models for the RF propagation because they know each other's location. Right. And then they are going to do the estimation. Is that pretty much it? It's not, it obviously doesn't get to the depth of what you need for RTLS placement, but just obviously yeah so this basic this, triangulation. yeah this thing i sh no triangulation it's a uh, sorry but yeah, basic yeah, yeah. basic ap placement yeah, 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 yeah. forming triangles yeah sorry. so that's kind of the summary what i wanted to say about differentiator of airtight whips a quick question on things like miracast devices and chromecast and apple tvs how granular do you get in pulling those out uh in term, okay they will be visible as if they are acting as clients or ap's but if it is a apple tv per se Probably not, because the idea is not to fingerprint the signature, but whether it is you know, connected to a network, not connected to a network, that kind is uh, really important, at least in this uh, part of the system. Thank you.